Section 20 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Geographic Instruction in the Public Schools by W. B. Powell. The purpose of teaching geography is the education of the learner. The methods of teaching the subject must be such as to secure the end sought. Different views exist among parents and also among teachers respecting what education should do for the learner. Some persons, representing the extreme on one side, believing that the acquisition of knowledge is the main purpose of education. Other persons, representing the extreme on the other side, believing that the training of the faculties of the child constitutes the main purpose of education. Between these two extremes, every grade of belief and every grade of practice respecting the purpose of education finds its adherence. In arranging a course of instruction for the children of the public schools of the District of Columbia, it had been assumed that both ends above named may be accomplished, namely that the children may be trained for the purpose of gaining power, and that while being trained, they may come into possession of knowledge that will be of value to them, and furthermore, that such training may be on lines of experience and investigation that will contribute to develop a power to ensure success in the future prosecution of the study and at the same time the acquisition of the knowledge that lays at the base of all geographical information the first important end to be secured by the study of geography is to train the learner to see geographic facts or recognize geographic phenomena when he sees them one who goes through the world with his eyes open is constantly learning and is ever in the possession of enjoyment. It is not an easy matter to train the beginner to see and know what there is to be seen and known by seeing when passing over a country. For instance, to see springs and know their causes, to see the wearing of river banks and the changing of the courses of streams and know their causes, to see the denuding of elevations and know its causes, to see filling and making of valleys and know their causes. This, however, can be done by a systematic course of training. The steps of such training, however, to ensure the desired result, must be sequential, and each must have its definite and well-outlined purpose. Another important end to be secured by studying geography, and one which sequentially follows the first step, is that training which will enable the learner to see geographic facts and to understand geographic phenomena from symbols or from examination of maps, and by reading text in connection therewith. An attempt to teach geography by reversing these steps will prove fatal to educational success, for it anticipates the strength of mind and its power to receive. The result of such instruction is not knowledge, but rote information. The latter purpose has in the past constituted the main effort of teaching geography in our schools. The first step, that of training the child to understand geographic phenomena when he sees them, has in the main been omitted. A third purpose of teaching geography is the acquisition of knowledge. This purpose is easily secured when the work for accomplishment of the first two purposes has been systematically carried out. If first knowledge is obtained in the right way, its value is almost inestimable from either of two points of view. First, as an acquisition of the mind on which it has made an impression, because obtained by contact with phenomena firsthand or from original sources, it will serve ever after as an interpreter of kindred information, whether received firsthand by contact with things or through symbolic channels. Second, as a possession of the mind, it is a nucleus to which all future information on the same subject obtained by original investigation or through symbolic channels will be added naturally and logically, thus ensuring a well-arranged body of information on that subject at every step of acquisition. The process of learning to see is slow. It is, however, easy if the beginning is made simple, and each step is made a sequential advance on its predecessor. The young mind grows by slow increments. It expands by short stages, but it grows and expands easily, as does its physical home, when given opportunity to do so naturally. To learn to see, the child must make purposive efforts in looking. He must be made to look for the purpose of discovering characteristics. Characteristics are not impressed easily. The young mind does not learn to see until it has looked many times and looked discriminatingly. Phenomena well adapted to the beginning of this kind of training are found in plants and animals. 
fortunately these are geographic phenomena a knowledge of which will be valuable in the future prosecution of geographic knowledge a study of the forms of leaves the colors of leaves the parts of leaves the growth of leaves involving comparisons and leading to conclusions will strengthen the mind systematically and develop its power to see a study of buds their forms their positions and their development will train the mind systematically but on a slightly different line from that resulting from the study of leaves there is in the study of buds a beginning of the study of cause and effect but so simple so easily understood that the most childlike mind if properly directed can master it correspondingly it may be said of other parts of the study of plants then may be said of plants in their entirety by simple steps each of which is taken many times the child advances to the knowledge of the forms of plant life and many of the sequential changes of the same the child's mind during this study is strengthened his breadth of seeing and thinking is enlarged for it has involved his knowledge of the phenomena of cold and warm weather of wet and dry weather of sunshine and cloud of springtime and summer of fall and winter and his experiences because of other relations of life than those of his school have been made to form a part of his knowledge as one compact interrelated entirety and to do office in that training which gives him the power to see and strength to discover cause and effect the work here indicated is possible in the schoolroom fortunately also it is the most profitable work that can be done for the accomplishment of those mechanical results which the school is expected to secure in a corresponding way the study of animals is equally profitable it is a little more difficult because the phenomena are not so easily secured for study a little more difficult again because the phenomena are not so easily understood as those of plants the child has been prepared for this more difficult work however by his study of plants it will be observed that in the study of units of work thus far named the child has been made acquainted with many geographic phenomena and has come into the possession of a large geographic vocabulary every word of which is the symbol of a geographic fact that has come into his possession by contact with the phenomenon itself to this extent then has the mind been trained geographically it may be said to have a geographic bent it will be observed also that the teaching thus far has had for its purpose first that training which leads to the perception of facts without reference to their causes facts of size color and form of which the vegetal and animal world furnish so great and delightful a variety and second the perception of facts of size color and form and also of use or purpose which involves an effort to see effect and to discover cause the materials for use in training the child in these two steps are easily obtained their investigation affords a most delightful occupation for the child which occupation correlates mental and physical activity in the acquisition of knowledge thus ensuring both mental and physical improvement the next series of units or facts is learned by both experiment and observation the child has become strong enough now to project causes and note results the unit or series of work is the study of vapor and its various phenomena as steam cloud rain hail mist and dew by experimenting the child sees water change to dust become invisible return to dust and finally look into his face from the ice pitcher as water again by repeated efforts by slow stages he learns the causes of clouds and their precipitation as rain he sees the morning mist rising from the sidewalk as water being carried away to be formed into drops to be returned again to the hilltop as water and by slow degrees and by easy steps he learns that the sun is lifting the water from the sea and from every other place where water is found in whatever form to the skies where it is gathered and drifted and cooled to be returned to the earth thus does he learn one great cause of geographic facts of geographic phenomena without which the mountains would not be denuded valleys would not be made springs would not become and rivers would not flow while the work in the study of plants and animals and in experimenting with water and studying its wonderful and interesting phenomena is going on the child is being trained in some of the simpler steps of the study of position he comes by this means into the possession of a vocabulary that is necessary for future use in the study of geography he learns many terms used in showing this relative positions of objects as up down above
below farther nearer beyond this side that side he studies the dimensions of definite areas as the teacher's desk the schoolroom in which he works he learns to represent things on paper with the pencil and placing articles in various positions on the desk he learns to represent them not in perspective but as objects on a flat surface thus he is led from the thing to the symbols of things and thus does he gain power to see things in symbols the school block or the park in front of the school or in some other part of the city is viewed examined and talked about it must be remembered that the talking about the block at this early stage of the work is most essential by repeated viewing repeated examinations and repeated conversations representing in oral symbols what has been seen and the relations of the things that have been seen the mind is caused to grow continuously and with a truly geographic bent an intermediate step is now thrown in that is a new symbol is introduced a symbol between the oral symbol and that of the map representation by the sandboard the block or lot or other portion of ground viewed and examined is represented on the sandboard in miniature in plastic material this is most profitable work in the development of judgment having thus made a miniature block or park on the sandboard in the schoolroom the child is led to represent the same on paper with the pencil and is led to invent the mechanical means by which the elevations and depressions may be represented giving further and valuable cultivation to the productive imagination on determinative lines next comes effort to read corresponding correct maps of parts of the city as blocks or parks which work at first must be very simple the measurable product of such reading is the conversation of the child in oral description and also the representation of what he sees on a little sandboard at his desk in plastic material the product of such work is of greatest value which is not measurable is the growth of the child's mind in learning to read facts from symbols for the world of geography which is to be to him a source of profit and delight throughout his future life will be presented to his mind mainly by means of symbols during all the work thus far outlined the child has been assigned no tasks or at most very few tasks he has been led to put forth purposive effort by an interest that the teacher has aroused in him in the subjects under consideration the kindergarten has been taken up into the primary school but the child has learned geographic terms has learned their uses by using them has learned their definitions by talking about them repeatedly and has learned to spell them by writing them many times in his little compositions he has learned the proper use of english idiom in the expression of geographic phenomena whose forms and other conditions he has sought to explain to his teacher our young learner is yet in the primary school while doing the different kinds of work enumerated above he has been learning to read having read many stories and descriptions and poems related to and based on the work which he has done and which enables him to understand thoroughly what he reads and which causes him to be interested in what he reads because it is the confirmation and expansion of that which he knows to be true as found by his own efforts very few if any tasks have been assigned yet the child has become an original investigator very few lessons have been prescribed yet the child has learned to use english for the expression of exact ideas and in their exact relation very few requirements have been demanded yet the child has made a delightful beginning in the most interesting study of geography if the purpose of the child's school life thus far had only been that he might learn to read no more profitable plan nor one more certain of true success could have been adopted if the purpose of the work had been only to teach him to talk correctly to use his mother tongue for a purpose accurately and at the same time exactly no better scheme could have been invented if the purpose of the work had been to train the child to see to discover to project to observe and to conclude within the limits of possibilities of his mind adapted here thereto no better process could have been employed the work however requires ideal teaching it is not done by the assignment of lessons on the part of the teacher it is not done by conning on the part of the child it is done by self-imposed purposive activity on the part of the child it is induced by a loving appreciation of the way the child learns and by a broad intellectual thoroughly planned leading on the part of the teacher 
thus far have i given what i am pleased here to state from the first circle of teaching of geography in the schools of washington the giving of geographic knowledge has been but a secondary consideration in the teaching of the subject thus far as will readily be seen it has been rather the ever-present aim of all the work to put the learner's mind in a rational attitude toward geographic phenomena quantity is of little importance in any school work more important is that presentation of subjects and that consideration of subjects that result in an attitude on the part of the learner towards these which may be characterized by intellectual alertness or interest intellectual exactness or accuracy and intellectual control or cultivated will the child who has finished a subject in school has not been put in a rational attitude toward that subject the learning must be such that it will nourish and give appetite for more and at the same time develop that intellectual activity and strength that will ensure success and continued pleasure in the further prosecution of the subject he who closes his german book to read no more because he has finished the subject has not been taught right and has studied largely in vain no matter how high he stands on his final examination so it is with any other subject the fault is always in the teaching and is found in the wrong idea of what should be taught or in a wrong selection no less than in the wrong methods of teaching what to teach is harder to determine than how to teach in our study thus far we have been brought in contact with two kinds of phenomena geographic conditions and causes of geographic facts neither has been studied however in a way to show its relation in the groups of geographic categories the child does not know he has been studying geography he has been growing familiar with the forms and other characteristics of naturalistic facts which however have been so grouped as to make their relations easily seen when he shall have reached the stage of progress in his development where it will be desirable and profitable for him to resolve his store of facts into categorical series he has been preparing for geographic study this preparation is not yet complete it must include a knowledge of humanistic phenomena which he must get first hand for geography involves a knowledge of men and of nations with the conditions of their lives and their related industries and commercial characteristics and achievements the second circle of studies may well begin with the study of humanistic phenomena now we study the life of the city in all its ramifications as far as the child is able to understand it the buildings of the city of what they are made for what they are used where the materials came from of which they are made how these are prepared and how they are transported home life under different conditions such as nationality and classes home interiors schools churches the uses of buildings and their corresponding structures thus fitting them for their uses the streets how they are named or designated how houses thereon are named or designated where bridges occur why they are there thus determining thoroughfares and principal streets by their causes the occupations of the people the productions of the city means of transportation means of communication means of lighting the city the water system of the city in its details the sewerage system which leads to a knowledge of the use of the river as a scavenger all of which knowledge with much more that cannot here be enumerated is gained by actual observation and experience and if properly done helps to lay the foundation for correct understanding of geography helps to prepare the child for the study of other cities which he has not visited but of which he may know by reading and by comparison with the facts of his own city which he has studied this group of facts should be taught thoroughly and with great care children twelve years of age are found in the city who have never seen the white house who do not know the relative positions of the capital and the treasury children graduates of the high school are found who have never seen the soldiers home and who do not know what it is for who do not know how washington is supplied with water or understand the meaning of the name conduit road such children are not found in great numbers but that a few have been found suggests that others may have been ill prepared for the study of geographic text and that perhaps all have had less preparation by contact with things than they should have had another group of phenomena to which the children's minds are directed and which must be taken up systematically consists of interesting facts having climactic causes the children do not study them as such because they do not know what climate is they however associate them in climactic categories while studying them thus being helped to understand climate 
its causes and effects logically when later they study the subject for that purpose they observe the coming and going of birds and note the time of year of each they observe the birds that do not leave and the kinds of home that each species builds they observe the coming of snow the coming of flowers and the lengths of the days with these times of years and learn to associate them as correlated facts but not as cause and effect they are yet too young to know the distinction this group of phenomena is large interesting and valuable for educative purposes like other groups to which i have called attention it must be passed after alluding to it enough in detail to make its character and purpose understood to the hearer our children have now grown strong in their power to see so purposive have been the steps by which their observation has been directed they are next taken to the fields to observe the decay of rocks the making of soil the running of streams the washing of hillsides the making of valleys the denuding of hilltops and the numerous other phenomena which the casual uncultivated reader does not see cannot see but which the student of geography should be trained to see before he is allowed to proceed further in the study much of this work is done in the schoolroom involving the examination of rocks the examination of pebbles and the study of the causes of their forms miniature coal mines are made to appear in the schoolroom the different kinds of coal are examined the causes for the existence of different kinds of coal need not trouble us at this time the different kinds of rock shale sandstone etc may be studied advantageously in the schoolroom the purpose of this is to give information and especially to open the eyes of the children and to put them in proper intellectual attitude to their surroundings when for any cause they go into the fields or onto the hilltops during the progress of the study of this last unit the children learn many valuable geographic facts facts that are valuable as interpreters in their further reading and as nuclei in their further acquisition of geographic information some of these are concepts of valleys of slopes of water divides of drainage areas of denuding of land surfaces of filling of lake basins and of changes in courses of streams they are the geographic alphabet for further reading and investigation some of these lessons must be given many times because the real meaning of some of the phenomena is difficult of perception during the progress of this series of lessons the children handle many specimens and talk about them make many river basins and sand and talk about them make many miniature ranges of hills and talk about them compound small valleys into larger ones and talk about them gather the waters of many little streams and carry them down into one large flow to lake or ocean define that is bound the smaller basins and in turn the large basins including the smaller ones thus building in the mind concepts by means of which later in the study they may be made to understand the great basins or drainage areas of which a continent is made during all this activity with the mind and hand they read about subjects upon which their minds and hands are engaged and thus learn the real meanings of words printed and correct uses of geographic terms thus learn to get geographic information from the printed text our next group of work for which the children are now prepared is the close study of a section of country having various characteristics first noting the different characteristics and recording them then representing the section on the sandboard and plastic materials in the study of field notes to do this in some cases it is found necessary to make the sand map in the field from observation and afterward make field notes that children may learn how to make field notes and then how to use them in the workshop or laboratory this power comes slowly but like all other acquisitions of power it comes easily if the steps are short sequential and taken often enough the next step is a representation of the section studied with pencil this representation is made from the sand map rather than directly from the section studied the next step is that of studying a wall map representing a section of country and then translating it in representation on the sand board this whole unit of work is given chiefly for the purpose of training children to see contour and other geographic facts and symbols that is for teaching children to interpret a map we have thus far if we have done our work as we have hoped to do trained our children to such a degree that in part at least they can be led to understand maps and texts that describe them they are now ready for the study of geography as found in the textbook 
the last group of units constitutes the second circle of geographic work. It should be stated here that during the process of this technical geographic work, the children read much of people and places, of industries, of products, and of processes. This reading is made intelligible by the preparation of children have had for it, and by the fact that most of it is either exemplified or illustrated in the schoolroom. The children have articles of clothing brought into the schoolroom to be examined, and to be compared with corresponding of articles of their own. They have products, both natural and manufactured, on their desks in abundance, for study, for comparison, for conversation. They have illustrations of fields, of factories, of processes. They study the changed form of materials, in connection with the processes and machines by which these forms are changed. They compare the crude materials with the marketable materials, and show where one kind is found in a package on the grocer's shelf, and name the processes by which the transformation is made. Thus they are made ready, in a further sense, to study the geography of the world, and to understand some of the very important and valuable facts which the study of geography discloses to him who knows how to read properly. One purpose of the work done thus far has been that of training the imagination of the child. If he goes from home, he sees other cities and compares them with his own, for which comparison he has been prepared. He sees hills, valleys, streams, plains, and other phenomena, which he interprets by that which he learned in his home study by comparing the two. If he does not travel from home, he takes journeys in imagination, for books are put into his hands for that purpose. He thus, in his imagination, visits other cities in distant states. These he finds on river banks or by the seaside. He sees ranges of hills, valleys, mountains, streams, dams, canals, factories. He witnesses processes and examines products in every step of which comparison is made and conclusions drawn. In this work, too, he is trained to estimate distances by comparing the unknown with the known, thus getting some adequate conception of direction and space. The children are now strong enough to look upon the world as a whole. They are acquainted with much of the phenomenon resulting from the facts that the earth is spherical, and that it resolves on its axis. They undoubtedly know these facts also, for an intelligent teacher could not thus long instruct children without being forced to tell them of these facts. They now, therefore, are to be acquainted with the globe representing the earth and its surface. They learn the grand land divisions of the earth and its chief water divisions, and learn the relations of each to all the others. Learn of the relative size of each, and approximately as nearly as they can be made to understand, the actual size of each in extreme breadth and length. They learn some facts of climate, without special study, of course, further than that derived from a knowledge of the relation of the axis of the earth to the plane of its orbit. This gives the opportunity for teaching belts or zones, and as far as it is taught at all, it is taught with accuracy. Now the children's knowledge of plants and animals and kinds of people about which they have been learning may be further enlarged, and each kind or group of facts related to its appropriate belt or zone home. The continents and oceans may be located in zone belts or climatic homes, and plants, animals, and men located in their respective parts of continents or oceans, thus correlating the old, or that which was previously learned, with the new. Thus may the learner see the globe divided into land and water, related to heat and cold, possessed of life, distributed by climatic causes, possessing characteristics consistent with and lives induced by such causes. The children are now prepared to study geography as the home of man, and as the result of man's skill and efforts, study geography by states, by civilizations, by socialistic phenomena, by economic phenomena. State lines may be made to mean something to the children now. Great and important lines of commerce may be fixed easily, because the children find out not only where they exist, but why they are there. But before these are studied in their detail, it is desirable to study the continent in its special structure of mountain ranges and consequent basins or drainage areas. For this, the children have been prepared by their previous work. To prevent making this part of my subject too long and too tedious, I will say that North America is studied physically, in which connection it is studied historically also, so that national lines or divisions are seen to move back and forth and finally become fixed by physical causes when such exist, as is the case frequently. The relations of these states are studied historically and politically. Commercial centers of commerce are fixed definitely, 
and the reasons for their location are ascertained either in history or in physical causes or in both the character value and extent of commerce of each city are definitely studied the relations of same are discovered and means by which such commerce is carried on are definitely known the character of the people their industries their habits of life are studied in each country comparisons are made and conclusions are drawn and causes are sought and sometimes if not in all cases ascertained natural products and manufactured products and articles of dress are studied other articles as of warfare or husbandry showing conditions and habits of life are brought into the schoolroom and examined and discussed the imaginations of the children are called on in picturing the lives and homes of the people of these countries in comparison with their own lives and their own homes the cultivation of the imagination is helped by the use of pictures and by the reading of texts describing and narrating by reading tales and poems the result of which is tested from time to time by the writing of essays and the representation in graphic form of what is in the minds of the children during the progress of this study the children are made to know how to get to these centers of commercial life thus do the children learn the relation of each state of the continent to the other states to say that they learn of steamboat lines and railroad lines and telegraph lines and express companies is unnecessary these are taught necessarily but as a means not as an end now the children are to study the united states as an entirety in a corresponding way the details of which need not here be given it should be said however that the states are grouped by physical characteristics and climatic conditions which in turn help to group them according to productions and industries and resources which in turn enable us to determine the character and occupations of the people in large belts or sections and at the same time to locate commercial centers now we have only to get the connecting links between these commercial centers or in other words the ways and processes of communication and transportation then we have a good general view of the united states and of the people of the united states where they are and what they are doing details in great number are avoided the definite locality of important places is insisted on as well as the means of communication by land and water between such important places the geographic history of the states and their cities having been learned at the outset we are now prepared to look again from the united states out on the continent and get the governmental relations between the states of the continent and the united states as a whole as well as with large commercial centers of the united states and the child is led to see lines of communication freighted with commerce and human life stretching between cities of different states each end of which is guarded by representatives from other states the child is made to know why such guards are placed there and what some other prerogatives are it will be seen that this is the geography of man and his doings and not the geography of state line boundaries and locations of capital cities and their sizes the relativity of the values of industries of the values of products of the areas of states of the populations of states of the sizes of cities of the industries of the cities etc are studied and represented in graphic form for comparison innumerable examples of which may be found in our schools at the proper time of year now before south america is studied we need to know a little more about the causes of climate many of the results of climate having been taken on faith without having had recourse to their causes some physical phenomena of the united states would have been better understood had the children known better the climatic causes such causes however it is believed are too difficult for them to master at the time of their development when the facts were learned the children are now stronger the climate of south america and its resulting effects are a little more difficult to understand than those of north america partly because they are farther from home so we give a little study of the trade winds their causes and effects and try to give an understanding if not of the causes certainly of the existence of the gulf stream and its effect on the climate which prepares the children for the study of south america in a way corresponding to that in which they studied north america it may be stated in passing that south america is studied largely in its commercial relations to the commercial centers of the united states the people of course demand a large part of our effort in the study of this country in point of quantity the study of south america is very small compared with that of north america or even of the united states now europe is studied in a corresponding way but europe is more difficult to study than south america the geographic history of north and south america is easily obtained and easily remembered because of its sequential character and because of its relation to our present condition 
the historical geography of europe however is long and complicated not much of it therefore is attempted the causes of climate however are studied and physical reasons for present state lines are considered europe is studied by representative nations in their relation to the united states and representative commercial centers of the united states in this study the locations of commercial centers are definitely fixed and means of communication are considered and learned of course the people are studied and their lives habits and industries are considered to accomplish these ends we study the habits of their representatives among us and ascertain their home life and fatherland by studying the causes of their coming here their manufactures are brought into the schoolroom and studied by comparison with our own the location of some of the representatives in this country is ascertained the location of some of our representatives in their country is ascertained the result of having such representatives in two countries is ascertained to some extent thus the children are made to know as far as they are able to understand the governmental the social and the commercial relations existing between the great centers of europe and those of america and while learning them they are led to consider their causes and their effects upon our lives and upon our industries and thus they come to know how man is making and changing geography now asia africa and oceanica are studied but to only a limited degree by comparison with europe or even by comparison with south america because there is not time to study them more the purpose of teaching geography in the school as it has been before stated is to train the children how to study it it is not possible to teach anything exhaustively it is not desirable we have trained children to see that an interesting purpose of their work in school is the knowledge of the geography of man of what he is of what he has been of what he is doing and of how he is related to the activities of the world and to the ever and constantly changing geographic phenomenon of the world later in the school course if i may speak definitely in the eighth grade the children have a study of the essential outlines of physical geography from a logical and scientific standpoint during which study there is opportunity for relegating the vast amount of phenomenon with which they have become acquainted during their study of geography into categorical series and thus classifying them sequentially and logically i must not omit one other point i have stated from time to time that our children do much reading from standard authors accounts of travels descriptions of people and of countries expositions of processes etc which they are able to understand because of the character of their preparation for such reading namely their contact with things first hand i have stated also that the teacher and children avail themselves of charts and maps and pictures or graphic representations almost without number or limit for the purpose of explanation elaboration or more definite view some schoolrooms being veritable museums or picture galleries for instance when a city like london or philadelphia is being studied these pictures hang side by side with washington pictures with which they are being compared but there is one other class of reading for which we have been preparing our children which without this preparation could not be appreciated by them even if it could be made intelligible to them i mean pure literature that has for a part of its contents facts of nature all of which when properly studied is a part of the study of geography i do not refer to that valuable literature used largely in getting information of which i have spoken so much in this paper as for that instance by bayard taylor in his accounts of other lands washington irving in tales of travel such as his voyages italian scenes descriptions of london john burroughs in his fascinating accounts of animals and their haunts and other similar authors this is studied as a means of getting information i refer to a body of pure literature whose office is to please and cultivate rather than to instruct alhambra by moonlight a description of niagara a description of a storm at sea oliver wendell holmes's chambered nautilus gray's elegy in a country churchyard which hears barefoot boy bryant's waterfowl and proctor's the sea represent this literature i thought the sparrow's note from heaven singing at dawn on a tire alder bough i brought him home in his nest at even he sings a song but it pleases not now for i did not bring home the river and sky he sang to my ear they sang to my eye one must get close to nature and know it well must learn much of birds and flowers must commune with a river and sky as a lover to understand how mr emerson could see them in the enchanting part of birdsong 
ye banks and briars o bonny doon how can ye bloom so fresh and fair how can ye chant ye little birds and i so weary so full of care no dictionary can define for the student this most masterful contrast of english tongue no grammar or rhetoric explain it no eloquent master develop it he alone can know and feel its full force who though life may have given to him the darkest sorrow knows by experience of the carolling of birds of flowery banks of chattering brooks and of carpeted meadowlands stretching to shaded nooks in the hillside beyond a large part not the larger part of our literature can be understood and appreciated only by him who has been properly prepared to study geography aright how many men and women how many students read such literature only as words this body of literature is to be studied and classified and known by authors as literature proceeding from a knowledge and love of nature end of section twenty